Hello everyone, I'm Jennifer Lokash from Memorial University's Department of English. Welcome to Sparkles 2022, an imprint, we might say, of the Sparks Literary Festival. It has been hard times for organizers of live events like Sparks. We have been thwarted in our efforts to put on a full festival multiple times in these past two years, but we have been quietly fanning the festival embers, and this year my colleagues have planned a series of explosive events in flexible formats that continue the project of celebrating the amazing variety of genres, styles, and subjects created by writers in our very midst, crackling with talent and inspiration. Like other Memorial University events that celebrate the rich and sometimes wild literary landscapes of this province, such as our own Visiting Writers series, our Writer in Residence program, and the Office of Alumni Engagement's book club, winningly called Coastlines, to name a few, Sparks has been sharing great writing with appreciative audiences since my colleague Mary Dalton conceived of the festival a remarkable 12 years ago. We are acutely conscious that the beautiful lands on which Memorial's campus are situated and which so vividly take shape in the foregrounds and backgrounds of the work showcased through Sparks are in the traditional territories of diverse Indigenous groups. We acknowledge with respect the histories and cultures of the Beothic, Mi'kmaq, Innu, and Inuit of this province. We fully commit through Sparks and our other departmental endeavors to honoring these histories and cultures through the crucial work of sharing and promoting many more indigenous and racialized voices in the years to come. So, what are these sparkles that we are sending up into the universe? Over the next few months, we will be hosting a panel event on genre fiction, an event called Seven Minute Stories, and a spring or summer poetry slam, hopefully in Bannerman Park. We will promote each of these events through our departmental social media and on our Sparks website, so look out for more information soon. For the opening event in the series, we have partnered with Rogers TV, thank you Rogers, to bring you first pages, readings and interviews with four Memorial alumni who will share with us some of their new and exciting work. I will take this opportunity to thank all of the magnificent writers outstanding interviewers and brilliant event hosts who will be involved in the Sparkles series. Your generosity and immense creativity is what keep us going. And last but not least, many thanks to you, our faithful Sparks audience, and to readers and lovers of words everywhere. I'm Christina Stocks, and I'm here with Claire Wilkshire, the author of The Love Olympics. I'm a graduate student at Memorial University, um, working on a creative thesis. Um, and now I'm just going to introduce Claire and her book, The Love Olympics. Dr. Claire Wilkshire has been a writer, editor, translator, and teacher. The Love Olympics is Claire's second book. Her first, Maxine, a novel, was published in 2013. Her short fiction has appeared in Grain, The New Quarterly, Event, and The Fiddlehead. She is a founding member of the Burning Rock Writers Group. Claire studied English and French at Memorial and completed a master's at McMaster and a PhD in English literature at UBC. She taught English and French at Memorial for 15 years before launching a career in editing. Claire is an editor for Riddle Fence Magazine, a senior editor at Breakwater Books, and the owner of Claire Wilkshire Language Services. Today, Claire will be reading from her recently published book, The Love Olympics. The Love Olympics is a collection of short fiction set in St. John's. The book is about love and all the different forms it occupies. The stories are brilliantly told, simultaneously full of heart, humor, and heartache. 
We see love in its forms through a cast of characters from different generations, which range from being close to only loosely connected to one another. This collection explores people's aspirations, fears, and vulnerabilities, their generosity and desire for connection, their willingness to see past flaws and appreciate other human beings and all their complexity. Claire's novel was recently long-listed for the BMO Winter Set Award, and we are so looking forward to hearing her do a short reading for us today. After you, Claire. Thank you so much, Christina, for that beautiful, thoughtful, articulate introduction. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I am going to read. Uh, I'm going to read from two stories. Um, I'll read excerpts. So the first story I'm going to read from is called Mothers. It's the first um, story in the book, and it's about uh, when children grow up and they go away, as so often happens in Newfoundland, for work or for university, um, and then they come back. They come back for holidays and what have you. So that's, that's where we are. This is from a story called Mothers. Over the long weekend, they burrow into the couch with blankets. They spend the morning watching videos, sending messages, snorting as they point out funny memes to each other. They spend hours gearing up to work on assignments for courses, and you start to wonder if you should make suggestions. Turn off the music, set a timer. But all of a sudden, when the afternoon is already well underway, they slave away for half an hour, and suddenly, bingo, the assignment is done. They wonder if they can defrost something for lunch. After lunch, they eat the grapes, all the grapes. They eat chips. They locate the crackers and the good cheese. You come into the kitchen when they've gone out and gather up the plates, the phone chargers, the half-empty Diet Coke bottles, the bowls with remnants of cereal or pea soup, the, dregs, the mugs with dregs of lemon tea. You rinse the coffee grounds out of the bottom of the French press and put the guitar back in its case and fold the throw on the armchair and load the dishwasher and turn it on. You wipe down the table and soon comes the thud of the front door and they are back. Their arms circle around you and they are laughing. You are laughing. They are young and strong and warm except for the frozen hands they put at the back of your neck to make you squeak. And you put out more food. You tell them to help themselves to settle in, to be comfortable to leave their laundry in a pile in the hall because you'll throw a load on for them later. And they laugh again because they don't care about laundry. But really, you'd like to do their laundry. You look at a pair of feet and say, are those my socks? And a finger is placed on your lips while someone says, shh. You would like to do whatever would make their day easier. You want them to feel good here, to want to come back to bring their light and their warmth and their smiles into the house and deposit them everywhere like flotsam, like little bunches of grapes, close and fat and sweet. The night before they leave, they traipse into their bedroom while you're in the ensuite with the door open. They drape themselves over the bed, one on top of the comforter and the other underneath, one with limbs all sprawly, the other bunched up for maximal heat conservation. They are gazing up at the ceiling or at the screen of a phone, and their words come out in little lazy clumps with long spaces between them as you brush your teeth and wipe your mouth. No one is addressing anyone in particular as you lift the edge of the comforter and crawl in, pushing gently at the nesting one who shuffles over a little to make room. And you're three quarters asleep by the time they roll slowly over and brush their lips up against your cheek and murmur good night. The bed heaves and they pad away to their rooms as you roll into the warm space they've vacated and try to pretend that they're still there, that the alarm won't go off in the middle of the night and set your heart skittering like a baby goat, and that you won't check the departures website and help them load their bags into the trunk and wait until they've checked in just in case and walk them to the security area and squeeze them tight and turn away quickly, rubbing the back of your hand over your cheek and heading out in the dark to the cold, empty car. So that's the end of the story called Mothers. And uh, I'm going to read another excerpt from uh, much later on in the book. This is a story called Dating. And it's about Kimberly, who is um, around 40. And she has separated from her husband, uh, whom she discovered with uh, another person. Um, so she's go launched into online dating and figuring out a new life for herself. So this is a process of transformation. So this is about Kimberly. 
the divorce was finally imminent. Kimberly was getting ready to move out of her rented condo and buy her own house, a place Kevin had never set foot in, and that was only one of the nice things about it. The kitchen walls were buttercup yellow, the trim was white, and the whole place felt sunny inside and out. She had to buy a few things, one of which was a new dishwasher. When she walked into the deserted store on a Friday night, the washers and dryers in their neat intersecting rows looked like abandoned houses in an appliance village where all the people had fled. The first salesman she saw said, hi, sweetie, and she wanted to say something rude in return, but she exercised restraint. She looked at the dishwashers and said, I want someone to come and deliver it and disconnect the old one, take it away, and hook up the new one. Will they do that? He said they wouldn't do that because of insurance, liability, something or other. They couldn't do the connecting or the disconnecting, but dishwashers weren't that tricky. She could do it herself. She fixed him in her sights. I appreciate your confidence in me, she said, which was untrue. But you don't know if I can do that. Anyway, I don't want to do it. I want someone else to do it. He had wide cheeks with tiny blood vessels tangled like spaghettini, and he looked mildly athletic, neither young nor old, but somewhere in between. There's not a lot to it, he said. Have you ever done it? He showed her to the dishwasher neighborhood and disappeared while she looked around, returning a few minutes later. I just watched a YouTube video, he said. There's uh, actually a bit more to it than I thought. But you said I could do it. She was annoyed enough to rub it in. Yeah, but in the video, it looks a bit more complicated. Kimberly scrutinized him and wondered if he was single, if he was active on a dating site, how to avoid running into him there. The day after the appliance village, she went to a furniture outlet where a business-like woman named Tammy showed her the dishwashers and said she would need to arrange for someone to unhook the old one and hook up the new one because the delivery men wouldn't do that. Probably not the sort of thing you want to take on yourself, Tammy said. Dishwashers can be complicated. Tammy looked hardly old enough to own a dishwasher, and yet she wore a quiet authority like a classic suit. She provided a card with the name of a guy who would do the necessary. We're having customer appreciation days, she said. There's a table by the door. Have a sandwich. Fill out a ballot for the draw. There's cookies. Kimberly ate a triangular ham sandwich while Tammy prepared the paperwork for the delivery in a month's time. She loved ham sandwiches, and the triangular ones always tasted better. At 20 to 9 that evening, she was getting ready to go out when the phone rang. This is Tammy, said the voice. She wasn't late, not yet, but she needed to leave soon because guess what? It was Saturday night, and Kimberly had a date. Oh, yeah, so take that, universe of doom. This just might be the guy who would be nice to her, the one she'd have a laugh with, who would look at her and smile because he thought she was funny and a good person, who would appreciate her better qualities. She didn't want to be late in case Sean turned out to be that very guy and she was standing there with her hair wet from the shower and one leg of her good jeans on and the phone wedged in her neck as she wriggled her foot into the other leg. She had no idea who Tammy was. The ballot you filled out today, you won. You won a convertible. There was a brief silence. Very brief, it lasted maybe a second in which she dropped the jeans and thought about guys who drove convertibles. They were usually guys. She didn't like them. They always looked rich and smug, every one of them. The shoulder-length flowy white hair and the tan. She couldn't stand that look, the ostentation. They filled her with disgust. She could sell the convertible. They were worth a fortune. How much were they worth? She could furnish her new house with that kind of money. In the same second, she knew that for the first time in her life, she wanted a convertible. She wanted to drive along Water Street on a warm summer afternoon with giant sunglasses and the wind in her hair. She'd have to grow it out a little. No way was she selling that car. However wasteful it was, she would keep it. She'd drive it whenever she felt like it. If she looked rich and smug, so be it. So much the better. A convertible sofa, Tammy said. The store's closed, but I wanted to call and tell you the good news. So that's a bit of dating. <laughs> I love that part. <laughs> it's so funny. Thank you. <laughs> um, I guess to go back to sort of uh, your first story, um, I also love that story so much. It was kind of the impetus. I mean, this is the first time I've ever lived away from home. Um, and I, I found myself calling my mom and my grandma <laughs> and every person I've missed Aww. back home just because it's so true, right? It's just so to the core of, you know, coming home and having that. So it's, I think it's kind of a universal 
Um, I, I, I love that story, but thank you, so. thank you for reading that part. And um, I also wanted to ask a little bit about Kimberly and your research process um, for <laughs> Kimberly's uh, a dating experience, if maybe you could delve a little bit into that for us. Sure. Well, um, the first story, Mothers, uh, this is not an autobiographical book, but that story is fairly close to what's happened in my life, so I am very familiar with the process of letting a young person go and wanting them back and missing them and all that, so that's very kind of heartfelt from my point of view. But Kimberly's journey was, was not one that I was uh, as familiar with, so I did have to do some research into that. So I have never done online dating because uh, I've been with my husband, Larry Matthews, who's a writer and uh, former MUN professor. Uh, we've been together for uh, since Christ was on the cross, as one of my <laughs> friends would say. So, uh, so uh, that's not something I've Done. So I signed up on Plenty of Fish and created a profile without a picture under a fake name because uh, I had to know how it worked. I mean, I'd yeah. heard people talking about it and I actually asked a number of probing questions of friends and they seemed like they didn't really want to discuss the intimate details of their dating lives with me. Imagine. And I was surprised <laughs> at that. I thought, come on, it's just like, you know, it's just experiences. But when I pushed, they they got more and more reluctant to disclose. So I had to go in there and find out what it was like myself. So that was that was a real eye opener. Yes, that's uh, I find that so funny and wonderful, you know, and the way Kim really responds in that story too is is it's just hilarious. It's so great. So thank you. What would you say your research process was for the rest of the novel? Do you have a certain way that you go about it or a lot of those stories don't really require research. I mean, the uh, the online dating experience was was really fascinating for me, and it, it really gave me an insight into. I don't want to give the impression that I feel at all kind of dismissive of that. I know there are a lot of people who don't have the opportunity because they work a lot and they they are committed in many ways, and they just don't have time to go out and join. And of course, it's COVID; you can't go out and join in-person activities. So uh, I actually feel a lot of admiration for the people who make themselves vulnerable and put themselves out there and kind of extend the branch and see what comes back. I think it takes a lot of courage. Um, so there's that. But also in that story, I did have to find out about zip lining uh, because she goes zip lining. So that was another learning experience. When you started writing this collection, did you know you wanted the stories to be linked or did that come later? I think that came later. Yeah, I hadn't written uh, for some time after my novel came out, and I just started writing a story, and then I wrote another story, and after a few stories, I started to think, wow, I think I'd like to, uh, to write a collection, and also I think I'd like it to be an interconnected collection. And I was thinking, actually, of Bernice Morgan's uh, book, The Topography of Love, which came out mm, over 20 years ago now, and uh, a section of that, a section of the stories in that book are also interconnected and it's it's set in uh, around here uh, as well. So, and Bernice is another um, uh, Breakwater author, so we're actually very fortunate because Breakwater is a publisher that's, because they're committed to publishing Newfoundland writing, they promote, um, they will publish, for example, drama, poetry, and in particular, short stories, whereas I know there are a lot of publishers that won't even look at short stories because they don't sell enough. So, uh, so I really appreciate being with a publisher that cares enough about literature that they're not just gonna throw away a bunch of genres because they're not, uh, they don't have the same popular appeal. Right. But I've always loved stories because you get a lot of variety in a collection of short stories. Yeah. There's a lot going on. Well, thank you. Um, I guess to that end, so did the characters come to you first for the Love Olympics, or was it plot? What would you say? Yeah, the characters first. Yeah, you're yeah. right. Yeah. The plot, you sort of figure out later. I'm less interested in plot. I'm always interested in the people and how they interact. Right. Yeah. In the Love Olympics, you inhabit many different circumstances, perspectives, and characters. Is there a particular story that has a special place in your heart? Uh, perhaps one that was the seed or the idea for the book? I think in a way they, they all have special places in my right. heart because you do get sort of attached to them. Um, the one that I wrote first for this book is Snow. 
Uh, it's not the first story in the collection, but it's one I do feel particularly attached to because it was the beginning of the book uh, for me, I guess. It was the, the place where I started writing again, and it uh, I wrote it using... It was a very different writing experience for me from any other that I had had okay. until then. So uh, so I, I do feel a, a fondness for that. But if pressed, I would have to confess that I feel a fondness for the other ones too. That's very fair. Me too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so is there a specific story you had the most challenging time writing, would you say? I did. Uh, it's called Work in Progress. So that seems sort of suited to the most challenging story. I guess, uh, right. although that wasn't why I called it that. Um, Work in Progress is, is a story about a young woman and it was just very disparate. It was a whole bunch of separate pieces and they weren't coming together and I rewrote and rewrote and rewrote and thought, mm, I'm gonna have to uh, leave this one out of the book. It's just not coming together. And I had Jessica Grant as my substantive editor and she's just incredible. I love her her writing so much. I love Come Thou Tortoise. It's an absolutely brilliant book. And she was incredibly helpful. And she also was, uh, she was encouraging me to work more on the story, but I think we were kind of in agreement that if it didn't fit together a little bit better, it wasn't going to work. So I worked and worked and worked and worked and didn't work and didn't work and didn't work and didn't work. And then it was sort of the day before the whole thing had to be finished. And it just started coming together. I just cut a whole bunch of stuff and put more stuff in and all of a sudden I thought, oh, okay, I think it works now. So oh, Perfect, it does. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so your characters are so lively, which I think we've talked a bit about, you know. Um, I did, especially with the Nan character, um, I did feel like I was eavesdropping on my own Nan. Um, oh, that's nice to hear. Yeah, and I, how much inspiration would you say the real people in your life have on your characters? Well, I didn't grow up with a nan around, so uh, so she is uh, a fictional, she's very much a fictional character, right. um, but there are lots of things that have happened to nan that are transformations of things that I know of, that have, things that have happened to people who are close to me, I guess, yeah. so okay. not the same things, but similar things. So she's a, she's a bit of a composite. Right. So I think the Love Olympics is so vibrant and brilliantly written, um, which I'm sure can be attributed to your vast experience. You know, you've, you're a writer, um, you have a background in publishing and editing and teaching. Um, have you always known that you wanted to be a writer? Um, and what is your writing practice like? Uh, no, I didn't always know that I wanted to be a writer, uh, but I was, I was at university and there was a creative writing course being offered and there was a guy I kind of had a crush on who was going to be taking the course and uh, he said you should take this course and uh, I thought oh okay so but I didn't know how to do it I it was poetry or something and I'd never written a poem in my life but but he was kind of cute so I thought okay I'll, I'll take the course and then uh, course ended up being it was taught by someone who's new to the faculty at the time Larry Matthews who's now been my husband for many decades so uh, so I guess you could say that worked out and um, I learned a lot from him about contemporary Canadian literature and writing and many other things as well hey, it's kismet <laughs> I guess so That's yeah. lovely um, what do you think the best investment a young writer could make if they're right at the beginning of their writing process? That's tricky because it, it's a pretty individual thing, I think. Um, I, I gravitated towards academics and I enjoyed being able to study literature because I read books that I would never have read otherwise and, um, and I was forced to consider things about them that I wouldn't have thought of and to research other people's thoughts about them so mm -hmm. I think you learn a lot that's not uh, that doesn't sort of occur to you if you're if you were studying in that way and so not everybody has the opportunity to go to university but there's tons of stuff online there are, you know online there's free online courses 
So I think uh, there's podcasts and all that. Those kinds of resources, I think, are really helpful just to get other people's perspectives on what books are important, what books are engaging, what makes them work well. Um, mm. So that would, be, that would be a good start. Do you have any favorite books on writing for that sort of... No, I like reading writers that I like and yeah. seeing what they're doing. So, for example, Lisa Moore has been hugely important for me. And her collection, Something for Everyone, her collection of stories from a couple of years ago, uh, is just, it's just bursting with energy in every single sentence. And whenever I write really flat, dull sentences, I think, oh, Lisa would never have written a sentence like this. So not, I'm not comparing my writing to hers, but, but I think that's a, a kind of level of energy to emulate in fiction. I love sentences that are just humming with energy all the time. Mm. So friendship is a very common theme in your book. Um, how do your friendships and relationships support your writing? Um, I guess my friends and family have always been very supportive and uh, that's been great and they've they support me by listening to me going on and on and on and on endlessly about things that might end up in the book or might not and they encourage uh, but I get I've been in a writing group for a long time now for decades and we don't meet very often uh, but when we do meet we've all known each other for a really long time so it's great to people read usually so uh, to hear people read what they're working on and then to have a discussion about it afterwards that's incredibly energizing to think even if you've got nothing and you can't think of anything to write and you're stuck you can come away from a meeting thinking oh this person wrote that thing that was great that's giving me an idea about something so they're extremely supportive uh, the Burning Rock writers and uh, they've been they've opened my eyes to very many things over the years and they're a great fun bunch of people what do you like to do when you're not writing or editing? Um, I, I spend quite a lot of time writing or editing, uh, so there's not a ton of extra time. Um, when, I, when I submitted this book to Breakwater, who had published my novel, I had no idea that I would one day end up working at Breakwater, which is what I do now. I've been there for a little over a year, uh, which has been a fantastic and very illuminating experience. Um, so, uh, so yes, I'm pretty busy with that kind of thing, uh, between that a family and a very small number of private clients because I've wound down my business a lot, but I'm trying to, but I do keep a couple of other people that I do a little work for. So that's pretty flat out, but otherwise my great love is to conduct the French choir. Oh. So, um, I sort of learned a little bit about conducting over the years. I've been doing that for almost 15 years now. And choral conducting is a huge, complicated, challenging, fascinating thing to learn about. And it's when people are up there singing and you're moving your hands and they're doing what you ask them to, it's unbelievably thrilling to see people's faces suffused with the joy of singing. It's really amazing. I just really want to thank you for your time. I mean, I, I love this book so much and it's you know, as an aspiring writer, I found it, it, when you're speaking about something that's energizing and exciting, and that's how it felt to read it, and I, I just really want to thank you for that, because it's, uh, it's keeping me excited, so, and I, I really appreciate, appreciate you taking the time, and um, I, thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Christina. It's been just a joy to get to meet you in person, thank and, you. Uh, and uh, it sounds like you've had quite a range of courses and experiences since you uh, came to Memorial and I hope all the rest goes really well for you and I look forward to reading your book. Oh well thank you. I was lucky to be here so thanks so much. Thank you. <laughs>